hello and welcome. I'm David McMahon. I'm the Chief Executive with the Irish Skin Foundation. I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Anne-Marie Tobin, uh, the HSE Clinical Lead for Dermatology and a Consultant Dermatologist from uh, Tally University Hospital, and uh, Professor Brian Kirby from St. Vincent's Hospital and an expert in psoriasis. Um, we're recording this video because we know that many people living with and caring for someone with a skin condition may have concerns about COVID-19 and about how it may impact them. So um, today we'll be answering some of the more most frequently asked questions that the Irish Skin Foundation has received in the past few weeks. And we're going to, I suppose, give perspectives from, from, uh, from two experts in the area um, regarding coronavirus and skin conditions like psoriasis, eczema, HS and others. Um, but also, I suppose, we want to talk to people who may be expecting appointments in dermatology departments across the country over the next few months. Um, today is the 1st of April 2020, and the information provided here is correct at the time, but it is important to remember that our understanding of the virus and how it, it impacts uh, people with skin conditions is currently evolving. Um, uh, first question to, to Professor Tobin, to Anne-Marie. Um, a lot of patients are interested in what's happening in dermatology departments across the country at the moment. What can patients expect in, to happen in the next few months? So, David, an awful lot of the dermatology departments um, have ceased their regular outpatients, certainly all face-to-face -face contact, because this is in line with guidelines where we really want to reduce the number of patients who are coming into the hospitals because it's a risk benefit like what's the risk to the patient of coming to an appointment versus what the benefit is so a lot of departments are phoning patients um, regular follow-up patients so patients are receiving phone calls during the time period of their actual clinic appointments so let's say they're due to be there on a wednesday morning from half eight to half 12, they'll be wrong at some time during um, that appointment. Um, secondly, with regard to prescriptions, so new legislation has just come in where the date of prescriptions has now been extended from six month duration to a nine month duration. And also what has been brought online has been online um, prescribing so straight to um, the pharmacies involved. And so patients shouldn't be concerned about um, running out of their prescriptions um, because every effort is being made. The other thing um, is that most departments are still manning phones, not in a live sense, so you won't be able to ring up, but someone will there, be there to take a message and someone will ring you back if you have a concern. Um, and then for GPs, a lot of departments have set up an urgent email where urgent um, patients who require dermatology urgently can actually be seen. With regard to those patients with skin cancers, um, certain hospitals are still managing to run pigmented lesion clinics. Um, and we've just drawn up documents with the National Cancer Control Program identifying certain cancers where surgery will go ahead um, despite the restrictions on elective practices. So for patients with thick melanomas or um, head and neck squamous cell carcinomas, their surgery will go ahead. Some of the surgery is being decanted from perhaps the original hospital to a private hospital, but they will go ahead and also they will be contacted uh, regarding their surgery. Okay, that's, uh, that's really helpful to know. Um, and um, uh, Professor Kirby, um, among the, the different groups of patients who are attending dermatology departments for treatment and for management of their skin conditions, um, which groups do you think are more at risk from contracting COVID-19 in the first place and you know, then perhaps at risk from, more at risk from the illness itself? Well, I think the first thing to say is that skin conditions per se, like psoriasis and atopic dermatitis and hydratinitis and most inflammatory and all inflammatory skin conditions doesn't present an increased risk to the patient as itself. Uh, and that's important to reassure patients. Um, the second thing, um, as it's recognized in the HSE website, uh, will give some information on this. There are certain people who are at higher risk. So those people are over 60 those people who've got diabetes, other background illnesses like chronic kidney disease, liver disease, 
lung disease or heart disease are at a higher risk of getting these. Um, for inflammatory skin disease such as psoriasis, there are medications that we use that do lower the immune system. That's how they treat psoriasis and also for psoriatic arthritis. Um, and this, if they're in the higher risk group and they're on this, they may, this may place them at a, at a higher risk. Um, there is advice therefore then on how people should look after themselves who are in, their, in this higher risk group. And at the moment, the HSE is saying that these people should cocoon. Similarly, if they're over 70, if they've got diabetes, kidney disease, and the other disease that I'd mentioned anyway. Um, the next question then that arises is whether people are taking immunosuppressants for, and they're not in that high risk group, whether they're at an increased risk or not. Um, to date, we've no evidence from Wuhan and from Italy that these medications do increase your risk of contracting the virus. Nonetheless, they, the numbers are probably too small to make a definite statement on this. Um, and we are aware that these medications can increase viral infections as a general rule. Now, if we deal with psoriasis specifically, um, if you're on an immunosuppressant and you don't have any of the high-risk groups, so for example, if you're 40 and you're taking a, a biologic such as a TNF, we think your risk of contracting uh, COVID compared to the guy sitting beside you is, is increased, but not hugely so. And the current international guidelines are that you should do what all of us have been mandated to do by the government, which is to stay at home, minimize your contact with other people. Um, but that if you do get ill, as in if you do get a temperature, that you should stop the medication and seek the appropriate advice as per whether you may have COVID-19 or not. So there, so there's, so this is um, this is based on on the on the HSE's current understanding of of the of the of the situation. So they have, so in the current circumstances, certain groups of people have, are are being asked to cocoon. And I suppose, you know, this is still, there's a certain amount of interpretation about that still uh, occurring. Yeah, I think we're seeking clarification from the HSE really about whether the drugs that are commonly used for psoriasis and eczema um, and uh, hydradenitis, particularly, which are the mo most immunosuppressants that we use, but also things like lupus and other blistering diseases, whether these put people at higher risk and they need to cocoon or to do what everybody has been mandated to do and stay at home and have minimal social contacts. Um, the, uh, when you're allowed out for shopping or exercising within two kilometers. So we need clarification as to whether single agent immunosuppression, um, which is relatively low immunosuppression, and those people need to cocoon or not. The international guidelines are that at the moment they don't need to cocoon, but that they should take the precautions that all of us are having. So you've got people who have other risk factors on single agent immunosuppression for inflammatory skin disease, who should follow the guidelines for the high risk groups and then we have people who don't have any of those high risk factors who are on single agent immunosuppression. We need clarification from the HSE as to what they should do, but the international guidance at the moment is that they should follow what everybody else is doing, that the risk is not particularly high. Um, and I think the key to this is people shouldn't be too anxious about these. Uh, for the most part, these medications are not going to add a huge amount to them um, in terms of their risk of immunosuppression. Um, and the second thing is to keep up to date because these guidelines are constantly changing. As you're aware, we're recording this on the 1st of April. Some of the guidance has changed already today and um, it will continue to change. Because uh, there are two issues. There's one, the anxiety surrounding patients are taking immunosuppression, which I think we want to reassure the majority of people that that risk is not huge uh, compared to their, if they didn't, weren't taking this, if they're on single agent immunosuppression, certainly. And the second thing is that we have a responsibility to other people that we don't, if we get the virus, that we don't share it with other people. So we follow the restrictions um, that are mandated by the government and that keep up to date with the HSC. And uh, Professor Tobin, do you, what, what's your view of, of uh, you know, of this as well? Do you, do you agree with um, Professor Kirby's interpretation? No. No, I totally agree. There are certainly a number of our patients who will be at higher risk because of comorbidity and because of their age. But in younger patients, um, the risk isn't um, as great. So I would agree. 
So, so younger, younger patients who have no other risk factors who are on a single agent are probably, would probably receive maybe slightly nuanced or different guidance in yeah. time when that emerges. But it doesn't change the, the guidance. And David, we all really need to be careful. We all need to be staying home, minimizing our contacts and making sure like careful hygiene and cleaning surfaces, etc. Yeah, and I agree. I think whether you're on a mild immune or a single agent immunosuppression or not, you need everybody needs to be strictly yeah. follow these guidelines. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very important that we kind of reiterate that the no, nothing nothing we say in this video um, it precludes the the public health advice yeah. that's everywhere at the moment. It's the it's the main thing that we need to keep our eyes on. Um, we've over the last few weeks, many people have asked us. Um, you know, they're looking for advice about treatments. They're wondering about either stopping or delaying or reducing systemic drugs and biologics. I suppose, uh, you know, is there any evidence about, uh, about that if you stop or you reduce your treatment uh, that you can protect yourself better um, against either getting COVID-19 or having a worse outcome if you do uh, get the virus? I'll deal with psoriasis first. So it, there are probably a number of different patient groups within this. The first are those people who've got arthritis as well as psoriasis. So we're on medication to treat both their joint disease and their skin disease. The current recommendations from the rheumatologists are that they shouldn't stop their treatment. And the reasons for this are they may they risk a flare of their disease. Their disease may not just simply switch off again when they um, go back on this. And they may need to take oral steroids with their immunosuppressant, and that probably would increase the risk because they'd be on two agents of immunosuppression. So if you've got psoriatic arthritis and you've got psoriasis and you're on treatment for these, you should continue on your treatment. Again, the rheumatology advice is clear that if you do get ill or if you're suspecting of having um, COVID-19, that you should stop. And at that stage, that you, as well as following the guidelines about where you should seek treatment and diagnosis, that you would also contact your rheumatology department. I think so also your dermatology department at that stage, I think that would be very useful advice because then we can advise you what other things can be done. I think there are a percentage of patients who have less non-life-threatening psoriasis, who don't have psoriatic arthritis, who are on single agent immune suppression, that can consider pausing if they've got great anxiety about the virus. Um, the medication takes a while to get out of your system, um, and, but in time, it should reduce your risk if you were to develop this. However, your psoriasis will come back, and in the vast majority of people, and that can vary, that, but on average, it can take about eight to 10 weeks. If you're going to consider stopping your medication or having a pause in your medication, then you should consult back with your dermatology department, either the specialist nursing, or as Anne-Marie said, there is a telephone for advice. So I think it's a reasonable thing to consider it, but please don't do this without seeking expert advice to do that. Um, and I think the third group of people who don't have arthritis, but who've had severe unstable skin disease in the past, um, with psoriasis specifically, I'm just dealing with now, I think they should continue on their treatment and follow the guidelines with regards to preventing themselves from getting this infection. When it comes to things like eczema, and um, eczema, for example, if you stop medication, tends to flare quickly. If you're on oral steroids for any reason, you should not stop oral steroids without medical advice, and that can be quite a dangerous thing to do. And one of the biologics which is used in Ireland um, for eczema, which is called dipilimab, uh, at the moment it's only available on a, an early access program, so there aren't many people in the country on it. Nonetheless, if you stop that suddenly, it can rarely precipitate asthma and it offers a very low risk of infection generally, and therefore we'd recommend that people stay on this. Similarly, with hydradenitis, we recommend that people stay on their treatment. The majority of people are on single agent immunosuppression, and we think if they stop, that they will, their abscesses may come back and that may necessitate medical visit, for example, to the emergency department. But again, if people have grave concerns, stopping as time goes on should reduce their risk from this, but it's got to be balanced with the, the flare of their disease that may lead to them needing medical attention. And therefore that may actually increase their risk more than the medication itself. I think, David, um, I agree with all of what Brian's saying, and I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that this may actually go on for much longer than, you know, the 12 weeks. And in fact, COVID could be around for, you know, up to 12 months. 
I find the patients are pretty sensible themselves at balancing the risk to them of what it feels like to have their skin disease or they've had a severe psoriasis versus the risk of being on an agent. And for some patients, the anxiety of being on the agent actually trumps having their skin disease. I think patients in considering stopping need to think about the fact that it might be much longer. Hopefully not, but it might be longer than we expect. Okay, so there's actually still quite a bit for, for patients to weigh up and probably, mm. you know, they, because, because there's so much, there's so, so much, there's so much in that, it, it just, I suppose, underlines the importance of staying, importance of staying in touch with your local yeah. services and, yeah. and to, to stay in touch with your dermatology team. I think that's the key because we're our role individuals. Yeah. Yeah. And while we can give general advice about um, the sort of high risk groups or um, people that are low risk groups, you may have your own anxieties and your own individual issues. So therefore, I think the general advice would be to stay on treatment. Um, but that if you have grave anxiety about this, it's reasonable to pause in some cases, but that it should be done in conjunction with your dermatology department. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, and actually, that's a very that's really helpful to to you know to have that stated explicitly because there are you know on online or on social media on Twitter there are it's very easy to put a short question about some about about some of these issues, but the answers are just not that simple. They're yeah. they're individualized. It's quite complex, depending on the person, depending on all manner of factors. Um, okay, and um, Anne Marie, just on a national level. Um, do you do you expect blood tests, for instance? Um, do you think that they will go ahead as normal over the coming months? And should people be worried about any disruptions in relation to that? So, I don't think blood tests are going ahead at the moment. They're certainly not going ahead um, as walk-ins to the phlebotomy services in the hospitals. And anecdotally, most GPs are not providing blood tests. Um, with regard to patients, the approach we're adopting is that if patients have been stable and their blood tests have been good, I mean, there isn't an issue with patients having to go without blood tests for three months or so. Beyond that, I'm hoping that it won't go beyond that. But we have been renewing prescriptions um, in patients who, you know, have blood tests that have been stable. And I don't think there will be ready access to blood tests realistically within the next two to three months. At the moment, however, I just as you say, certainly in Vincent's, we have access to blood tests. Okay, yeah. And um, there are certain people where we think blood tests are important um, and that if we can do the monitoring, that they, it's, it's a safe thing for them to come in and get yeah. those done. And um, there's been quite a, a well set up system so they will be socially distanced mm -hmm. uh, from people when they come in. And there are certain medications that do require blood monitoring. I agree, Amory, there are certain people who are stable that don't yeah. need it. But at the moment, certainly in St. Vincent's, that we can offer that to them. And I think if people need blood tests, uh, if, if they're instructed by the department that they should have a blood test, they should do their best to be able to do that. But I agree, Amory, it's difficult for general practitioners, certainly at the moment. Yeah. So uh, you can probably expect, patients can probably expect that um, it, it local dermatology, their own, their own dermatology departments will, will take a view on their individual yeah. case and, 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 and contact them yeah. to ask them to come in or to, to make yes, them exactly. in some way. Okay, okay. And um, just I'm really on a, on a completely separate subject, um, but again, because we've had so many questions about this, um, hand washing. Um, we've had a lot of questions about soaps, uh, sanitizers, emollients, and um, uh, soap substitutes. Um, people with hand dermatitis um, and people who don't have hand dermatitis are finding it very difficult to tolerate washing their hands 20, 30 times a day. So I, I have three questions, related questions about that. The first really is um, just how should we be washing our hands? And the second is about soap and water. Is that really the best thing that we should be using? And lastly, about strengthening your skin barrier if, you're, if your skin is cracked um, and, and if your hands become painful. So with regards to the use of soap and water, it, it is the best because the spikes that you see on the surface of the virus actually makes the virus lipid soluble. So it's able to penetrate um, a lipid barrier. And the only thing that seems, or the most effective way of getting rid of it is actually using a soap. So people need to be washing their hands, for example, when they come in um, from outside, um, they need to be doing, you know, the 
hand washing that's been demonstrated on the HSE videos for 20 seconds, you know, making sure they clean all the surfaces in between their fingers, backs of their hands up to the wrist, tops of the fingers, and then cleaning the palms of their hands. Everyone's getting hand dermatitis. It's not just the patients with psoriasis and hand eczema. Um, healthcare workers are beginning to come down with it. And the trick to it is actually moisturizing after you clean your hands and at nighttime applying quite a thick and greasy moisturizer. And even if you need to put a pair of cotton gloves or socks over it. The other thing with regard to hand sanitizers, I think they're good when you're on the move. So using them when you don't have ready access to soap and water, but ideally soap and water is the best way of lowering the virus um, on hands and surfaces. Okay, and there's a, I think we have um, we have the HSE's hand washing video on on our on the Irishskin.ie already, okay. um, and um, uh, just in relation to emulsifying ointment, um, some people are using a emulsifying ointment to wash their hands. Do you have any view on that? I I, I prefer them to be using soap and water. They can okay. use emulsifying ointment as a moisturizer, but they need to wash with soap and water. And to remember to get right up to the wrists and yeah. maybe to use spoons in, in tubs and things like that yeah. that they may be using. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, we're, we're almost near the end of um, the interview and um, I suppose both of you uh, in St. Vincent's and in Tala have been in touch with many of your maybe quite worried patients over the last few weeks. Um, do you have any words of encouragement for people watching the video? Keep calm and carry on. <laughs> I, I think that's it, and, and probably in a nutshell. I think for people with skin disease, um, those people with severe skin disease who are on medications that they're concerned about, the vast, um, all of what we're dealing with are small increased risks associated with this. And this is the same when flu season comes around. Uh, we don't have a vaccine for this, which is why we're recommending that people protect themselves as much as possible. But that overall, that the risk of getting seriously ill from this infection is still very, very small. Um, and that for the vast majority of people, they should continue on the medication um, and continue to follow the guidelines as much as possible. And that in time, we will come out at the end of this. Um, and it really is a collective effort, both from those people with skin disease and those people who, who don't have skin disease. That's the key. If we follow these guidelines, that this will hopefully uh, dissipate sooner rather than later. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Brian and Anne-Marie. Um, I, I suppose just finally, um, in relation to where people can go for advice of what they should be looking for, we're all inundated with um, uh, literally dozens of sources now. Um, do you, would you like to direct people to any particularly um, very good, any, any very good resources that you, you would say you would stand over? Um, well, one of the things I'd emphasize is to try and avoid the internet because there's an awful lot of misinformation um, out there. And I think that's been repeatedly highlighted by the Chief Medical Officer um, and the HSE. Um, I mean, one of the things that you've managed to do, which is quite good, is keep the nurse helpline going. So patients have access to a dermatology nurse if they want information. Another good website is dermnet.nz. It's a New Zealand website. Brian, I'm sure, will have more. I think uh, as well, the HSE website is good. It's been given very good updated information. As I say, we're seeking clarification on the immunosuppressant um, side of things, but otherwise they've been very good and very informative and very clear as to well what should happen. I think that should be the first protocol for all people. So people with skin disease or people caring mm -hmm. for skin disease are concerned about it. Um, I think the Bridge Association Dermatologists have produced um, some good information as well. Um, and obviously you'll be giving some good information on the Irish Skin Foundation. I'd like to repeat Anne-Marie's caution. There is so much information out there. There's coronavirus overload. And um, a lot of that information is in, in, inaccurate and incorrect. Um, there have been some accidents um, with people taking medications that they are, what they thought were medications because they thought this may help potential coronavirus. And there will be all sorts of, to use my kid's phrase or another phrase, fake news out there really try and stick to the reliable sources. Yeah. And if you've got skin disease, HSE website should be your first protocol. 
Irish Skin Foundation and British Association Dermatologists, bearing in mind that the British Association Dermatologists is under a, a different government and a different jurisdiction, so some of the information won't apply to us. Um, but number one, HSE, I look at it every morning, and I don't look at it again. Uh, I think that's the other point, is not to keep looking at all of these sources of information because it can become overwhelming. Try and, try and for your own mental health, stick to looking at this once a day if you feel you need to, and unfortunately, I feel I need to. Great advice. Thank you very much. And I'd, I'd just like to thank Professor Brian Kirby and Professor Anne-Marie uh, Tobin for their time today. Um, remember that you can also contact the Irish Skin Foundation uh, through irishskin.ie for advice um, and guidance and that our helpline is open. Um, in the meantime, please stay at home and please stay safe. Thank you very much.